All right, turn to Revelation chapter 1. I'm very excited about starting the book of Revelation with all of you this morning. Um, even though I've taught through this book numerous times over the years, uh, for some reason this just feels a little bit different. And I think that's because of what we've seen, what we have experienced over the last two, two and a half years or so. In other words, everything in our world, politically, socially, environmentally, uh, scientifically, and above all, spiritually, has gone through a dramatic shift over the last few years. Uh, Bible students all over the world are sensing that something dramatic is about to happen. It's just around the corner. Those who research, those who study Bible prophecy are, are sensing that the times we are living in are very different than previous generations. And it's true. I mean, things are different. There's been a major shift going on throughout the world, but it's all part of God's plan. Uh, we recently saw in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 how Jesus gave warnings to the Jewish people about coming events. First, he talked about warnings about coming events in the near future, which was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And that happened in 70 A.D. under General Titus. Then he also gave the Jews warnings about things that would happen in the last days. He said there in Matthew 24, 15, When you see the abomination of the, that causes desolation standing in the holy place, and he's referring to when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple in the last days, when you see that, he says he will be demanding worship as God. Jesus says when, that, when you see that take place, uh, the Jews need to flee, he says, Ju Jerusalem, flee Judea, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. And so he's re re talking about the Jews during the last days, because he says what's going to happen right after the abomination of desolation. This is Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews, those days will be shortened. So Jesus speaks of that horrible seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. Now, it's in the book of Revelation. The Great Tribulation is described in great detail. From chapter 6 through 18, that is what the Great Tribulation is all about. Literally, it comprises two-thirds of this entire book of prophecy. As the Great Tribulation comes closer and closer into view, Jesus also tells us that just prior to this time, when God pours out His wrath, when He pours out His judgment, the world will experience birth pangs. In other words, there will be great convulsions throughout the world. Jesus says there in Matthew 24, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Again, the word for nation is ethnos, where we get the word for ethnic, ethnic groups. So there'll be ethnic clashes throughout the world. We've seen a lot of that. He says kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. Um, we're seeing that, I mean, on a limited scale with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but it's all leading up towards the battle of Arm, um, not Armageddon, the battle that is found in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where Russia, their big play is to come into Israel. And God will step in and he's going to wipe out, according to the old King James, five sixths of the Russian army when they try to do that. Again, it's going to get worse and worse in the last days. We're seeing kingdom against kingdom right now. The kingdom of darkness is doing all it can to try and come against the kingdom of God, his people, you and I. And it's going to get worse. Jesus also says there in Matthew 24 that in these last days there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. And those things will be on the rise. Those things have always been with us, but he says it's going to increase in the last days. Again, Jesus says in the midst of all this, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And for these reasons and many others that we'll be talking about over the next coming months, uh, I truly believe that we are living uh, at the very beginning of the end, the, the beginning of the very end of time. To me, that also means that the rapture could happen at any moment. Either you are with Christ and you'll go up in the rapture, 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, or you'll be left behind, and then soon after the raptures when the great tribulation will start. This is truly what the book of Revelation is all about, seeing Jesus in all of his glory. That's the reason why he's going to take us out of here, so we can be in our resurrection bodies, so we can see him face to face, and we should be coming into a greater understanding and appreciation of who Christ is, and also coming to the realization that he has everything under control. And it doesn't really matter how messed up and dysfunctional uh, the governments of this world are right now, because they are. It doesn't matter how ignorant our world leaders are, because they are. Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and that's what is revealed to us more than anything. Jesus is in control. He has got us safely in his hands, and he's allowing all these unbelieving, unsaved, worldly movers and shakers to do whatever they want to do here in these last days. And so it's going to keep getting worse and worse. That's what the Bible tells us. But as we'll see in this first chapter, Jesus is the Lord, he is the King, he is God Almighty, and, and he is the creator and sustainer of life. And when all is said and done, every person who has ever existed will either bow down and worship him willingly and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of the Father, which hopefully all of us will do, or the unbelievers will be forced to bow down and acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And Jesus will rule and reign for ever and ever. And that's the revelation of Christ in a nutshell here. That's what Jesus is going to reveal to the Apostle John through this amazing book. So let's look at the first few verses and see what he has for us, because this is foundational to the rest of the book. We won't get too far, but it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, gave Jesus, to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So let's break this down a little bit. Notice, first of all, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis, which is where we get the word for apocalypse. Now, when people in the world hear apocalypse, they think, oh, no, this is going to be horrible. This is going to be dreadful. It's the most, you know, uh, it's the worst possible scenario. Well, that's not what the word apocalypsis means. It means an unveiling. It means a revealing. If you had a you know, famous artist, he paints a picture and it's covered in a canvas. An apocalypsis would be when he lifts the canvas off and everybody's like, ooh, ah, oh, that's so wonderful. That's what apocalypsis means. You've seen some of these, you know, home and garden shows, and, you know, they go into somebody's house, and they do a remodel of the kitchen or whatever it might be, and they bring the people in blindfolded. When they take off the blindfold, they see their new kitchen, and they go, oh, oh, wonderful. Oh, my gosh, it's so beautiful. I never dreamed. You know, that's the apocalypsis, the unveiling. So... Yes, we will see God's wrath unveiled, but this revelation of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater, vastly more amazing than anything that this world could unveil. Whatever you think, oh, that's unveiled. Oh, that's wonderful. That is powerful. No, when Jesus is unveiled for the world to see, it is going to be the most incredible thing ever. Um, because he is going to be revealed in all of his glory, in all of his splendor, and his majesty. Later on, Lord willing, next week we'll get to the second half of this chapter, and we'll see Jesus in that glorious state. Notice in this introduction it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we'll see, this is also a revelation from Jesus Christ. Notice it says, which God gave him, Jesus, to show his servants... Dulos, uh, the messengers of chapters 2 and 3, will, will receive this message. And then it says, And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, Dulos, John. And then it says, Of John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony 
of Jesus Christ. As we'll see this letter that John, the Apostle John writes, it's going to go out to seven churches that are in ancient Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. And when John mentions his name here at the end of verse 1 to his servant John, everybody throughout Christianity knew who this was. This is the last surviving apostle. This is written around 96 A.D. He would be on the island of Patmos for approximately two years, 95, 96. He was put on this island by Domitian, the emperor. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But think about this. John's about the same age. He's about 96 years old, um, the last surviving apostle. He hasn't seen Jesus in over 60 years. He hasn't seen any of the other apostles in 25 to 30 years because they've all been put to death. They've all been martyred for their faith. But somehow the Apostle John had escaped death at the hands of the Roman Empire. But that didn't mean John was in hiding. He's not, you know, in, in fear. He's not, you know, hiding or living in, you know, some cave. No, he continued to serve the body of Christ until he would die in Ephesus around 100 years of age give or take. So Jesus had John safe in his hands until his earthly days were finished. Remember at the end of John's gospel, Jesus is restoring Peter. And then Peter says about John, what about this guy? You know, and Jesus says, hey, if I want John to be around until I come back, you know, what is that to you? So rumors started going around, oh, John's going to be alive when Jesus returns. Well, that's not what happened. That's not, and John even says that's not what's going to happen. But this is probably what he was referring to. He was going to be around until Jesus revealed the book of Revelation to him. But he could not die until God said, your time is up. You and I were safe and secure in God's hands until he says it's time to go. You know, many of you have been praying for Chuck. You know, he about three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, uh, pretty much dead he had a heart attack at home on the floor. He had another heart attack in the ambulance. He had a third heart attack when they get to the hospital. I get up to the hospital and see him, and I'm like, he looks dead to me. And he was pretty much gone. And they're, you know, we need to pray. He's like, okay, Lord, he's yours and all that. And and uh, he's going into rehab tomorrow. <laughs> he's he's doing great. It's amazing. God's hand is on him. He He's not going to die until God says, it's time to go. That's cutting it close. But he knew the Lord. He knows the Lord. So that's awesome. Anyway, here's the last surviving apostle. Later, we're going to see that he's banished to this island called Patmos. It's just a little remote island just off the, the coast there in present-day Turkey. He's there, again, put by Ro uh, the Roman emperor Domitian. Uh, Domitian reigned from about 81 to 96 AD. Domitian was brutal. He was um, putting to death hundreds of thousands of Christians at this time. It, it started with uh, Caesar Nero. He was wanting to kill off Christians. He blamed Christians for the fire that started in Rome in 64 AD. And then when he dies, Domitian takes over and he became even worse. Probably about the time John writes this, there's been close to a million uh, Christians that have been put to death. Within a 250-year period from Nero to Constantine, six million Christians would be martyred for their faith. So it was a brutal time. Uh, history says, you don't find it in the Word, but history says that uh, Domitian tried to have John boiled in oil, and when they dropped him in, it didn't do anything to him. And so he banishes him, and he'll talk about this in, in chapter 1 later on, that he would be banished to the island of, of Patmos because he's a political prisoner. Even today, Patmos is a little deserted island, very desolate. But as I've always said, when I talk about John being in desolation, being in isolation, that's where he receives the greatest revelation. And that's true for some of us. You might be in a place where you're going through isolation. You feel all alone. You feel like, eh, nobody cares, whatever. It's in that place of isolation that God can give you the greatest revelation. So always be attentive to what God wants to say. Notice also here in verse 1, it says that God gave this, uh, gave this to Jesus to show his servants, and this would also include you and me, things which must shortly take place. Now, First, he says, servant, it's doulos. 
Some of you notice the coffee out there in the foyer. It's called Dulos Coffee. Uh, you want to be a bond servant to coffee? <laughs> Buy our coffee. It'll make you a slave to coffee. No. But that's what doulos means. You're a bond servant, a bond slave. But we are to Jesus. Uh, we're a doulos of Christ. Are you surrendering your life to him? Is he your Lord, your master? Or are you still ruling your own life? You're still trying to live life your way. Listen, after seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ, hopefully you will quickly discover that nothing and no one can come close to being the perfect master over your life other than Jesus Christ. You know, Bob Dylan sang that song years ago, you got to serve somebody. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. We're all servants, slaves to something or someone. The greatest master of all is Jesus Christ. We must always keep him high and lifted up in our lives, in our families, in this church. He is the guest of honor. He's the one we worship. Now, what about this phrase where it says, these things which must shortly take place? By the way, this happens to be one of the reasons that so many critics come against the book of Revelation. See, it says right here, these things must shortly take place. It's been 2,000 years. You know, if John couldn't get this right, why would I want to pay attention to the rest of this Revelation? Well, a quick look at the meaning of this phrase in the Greek helps understand what this is saying to us. Uh, the Greek word is N-E-N-T-A-C-H-E-I, -T -A -T -A -E and it just means suddenly or quickly. It doesn't mean it's going to happen right away, even though it could, but it means that when it happens, it's going to be quickly, it's suddenly. Uh, we get the word in English, tachometer. Uh, what's the other one for your heart beating too fast? Tachycardia. That's where it comes from. It's beating very quickly. It's going rapidly. So tachometer, you, you're familiar with that. It measures the RPM in your car. If your car idles or whatever, eight or 900 RPMs, and you just, you know, you're in park, and you just go, vroom, all of a sudden, vroom, that thing shoots up to five or 6,000 RPM. That's what this means. When this starts, it's going to ramp up very quickly. Everything in Book of Revelation, most everything, it's going to happen within a seven-year period. It's like a pregnancy. Those of you women who were pregnant and had a baby, you know that nine months seems like a long time to have a baby. But then when the labor pain starts, Entakai! <laughs> it happens rapidly. It happens quickly. Stuff happens. So when these events in the book of Revelation start, they will happen in rapid succession. The bulk of these prophecies, again, take place in a seven-year period. So look at verse 3. He says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near." So again, just by reading, hearing, and keeping these things which are written in the book of Revelation, we're guaranteed to be blessed by God. So if you go through this, you read it, you hear it, you, you keep it or heed these things, that's when you're truly blessed. So why in the world would so many churches today avoid teaching this amazing book of prophecy from the Word of God? It's true. Most pastors and churches avoid the book of Revelation. They'll say things like, it's too hard to understand. There's too many mysteries. You know, there, there, there's too many symbols. It's a closed book. You know, we should keep it closed. You know, anybody can interpret this any way they want. Those are all excuses, but they're all lame excuses. Because as we'll see, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ, and he will reveal to us what's going to happen in the future, our near future today, and also what's going to happen in the future for those who reject Jesus Christ. He will reveal what he's going to do with Satan and all of the demons. He will reveal details about the coming judgment and wrath, the great tribulation. He's going to reveal probably the best details about the second coming of Christ when he comes from heaven to earth. That's what Revelation 19 is all about. Uh, he'll reveal to us the glorious 
reign of Christ for a thousand years. It's not a mystical number. Thousand, five times he says thousand years. He's going to rule and reign. Thousand years. Thousand years. And people are like, how many years is he going to reign? A long time. No, it says a thousand years. Come on. It's not that hard. We'll see that very clearly. He's going to unveil what the great white throne judgment is all about. And then he's going to give us... Um, Details in chapter 21 about the new heavens, the new creation, the universe, and a new earth he's going to create. And he gives us the greatest details about our eternal dwelling place in Revelation 21 and 22, which is New Jerusalem. That's our heavenly home. Amazing picture there. Again, the greatest revelation of all will be seeing Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, face to face. That's the greatest revelation. That is why this book is given to us. Hopefully, as we go through this book, we will experience a greater personal revelation of Jesus for ourselves. Yes, it's wonderful to see Jesus in the incarnation. Yeah, he was born in a manger, in a barn, laid in the manger. That's wonderful to see, and we talk about that every Christmas. It's great to see Jesus in the Gospels, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, opening blind eyes and ears. Uh, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. That's glorious. And one of the most amazing things about Jesus is we see him going to the cross because that's the whole purpose why he came from heaven to earth was to go to the cross, to allow himself to be beaten, tortured, nailed to the cross for us. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was the main reason why he came, to die for our sins, to die in our place. But all that and his resurrection, obviously, is how we have eternal life. But all those things are for this, to see him, to be with him in glory forever and ever. And that is what the revelation is all about. And so this is God's plan for the world, for us, for those who reject the Lord. So this is not a sealed book. This is a book he wants us to read and hear and then keep these things which are written in it for the time is near. And we're 2,000 years nearer than when John wrote this. The book of Daniel, it's a parallel book to Revelation. It's the Old Testament equivalent to Revelation. Many references to Daniel we'll see in Revelation. When Daniel wrote it, it was a closed book. And we know it was a closed book because... The angel told him to seal up this book. It's closed. But notice, this is what it says in Daniel chapter 12. This is the last verse of, or last chapter in Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And so here we are, the time of the end. So it's unsealed. It's not still sealed. Knowledge is increasing rapidly. He says knowledge shall increase. Well, knowledge doubles every few months now. It was like knowledge would double every thousand years, and every 500 years, and every hundred years. In the last century, it's been like every year, every six months. Now it's like every three months, knowledge doubles, literally. It's just crazy because of computers and everything else. We're living in an amazing time. So what a great time to be studying the powerful book of Revelation. Look at verse 4. So John writes, John, the apostle, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And this greetings from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So notice, first of all, the, the greeting is to these seven churches, which are in Asia Minor, again, located in present-day Turkey. When we get to chapters 2 and 3, Jesus, because he wrote epistles, he wrote letters. He will write seven letters to these seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. 
By the way, we're going to see this number seven mentioned 54 times in the book of Revelation. Again, the number seven is a number of completeness, the number of totality. We'll see that there are seven churches. There are seven seals on this scroll. There are seven trumpet judgments. There are seven bull judgments. There are seven thunderous voices which nobody knows what they thundered and said because John was told not to write them down. But the point is, the number seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. Seven days in a week. Seven notes on a musical scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. No, do, re, mi, fa. I can't even count. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. There you go, seven. Seven colors in a rainbow. I mean, it's just simply what it means. Seven churches. Why these seven? Because there were many that were more prominent at this time, bigger churches at this time. Uh, the church in Antioch was very important to the Gentiles. The church in Rome was big. Uh, church in Thessalonica. Church in Colossae. Church in Philippi. Again, none of those mentioned. So why are these seven mentioned? There's a very good reason why Jesus wrote to these specific churches. We'll go into great detail when we get to chapters 2 and 3, but the simple answer is Jesus chose these churches and He will address their problems and situations that were unique to them, but they're also unique to every church down through the ages. And these churches will also represent different phases of the church from Pentecost to the rapture. For these churches, he'll say they will either go into the Great Tribulation because they won't repent, or they're going to be taken before the Great Tribulation in the rapture. That's the Church of Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 10. So very important to look at these seven churches, why he gave them to us, why he picked these. He will also address um, every one of us as individuals who read those letters and he, because he says to every one of them, he who has an ear to hear, you got at least one ear looking around. Most of you have two. Some of you have three. No. <laughs> if you have an ear to hear, let the you know hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We need to hear what God is saying to us through these churches. He will give them encouraging words. He will give them words of warning. So he wants each one of us to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through these letters. He wants us to evaluate our church and our lives through these seven churches. Now, the first thing John says to these churches, notice again there in verse 4, grace to you and peace. Again, this is much more than just a common greeting. It is a common greeting of the day, but this is much more than that. The Christian church at this time was going through heavy-duty persecution, again, starting with Nero, now Domitian, and it would continue on, and there would be 10 Roman emperors that would put to death in a 250-year period about 6 million uh, followers of Christ. Our brothers and sisters in Christ were burned at the stake, they would be impaled on poles and dipped in tar and set on fire. They'd be fed to lions. They would go and in, thrown into arenas to battle gladiators with nothing to defend themselves. It was a brutal time. Why were they doing this to Christians? Because Christians refused to say, Caesar is Lord. That was the demand. You must recognize whatever Caesar was in charge, he is the Lord. And Christians like, no, Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the only Lord. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm not going to bow down to some human, you know, leader like a Caesar Nero or Caesar Domitian or Diocletian or all these other guys. And so no matter how difficult, it, you know, it might be in our lives today, we don't bow down to anyone but Jesus. It doesn't matter what our governments say. And you just look over the last two and a half years with the whole COVID thing and, and all this stuff, the fallout that we're seeing in our nation politically. Whatever lion might be chewing on you today, whatever arena you feel like you've been thrown into, the, the important thing is we need God's grace and His peace. Otherwise, and I've seen it all too often in Christians. You get bitter. You get angry. You just want to fight everybody and argue about everything. That's not what Jesus has for us. He wants us to walk in His grace and His peace. We're going to see one guy, Polycarp, 
who was a disciple of John, the Apostle John, and he'd served the Lord for 86 years. Well, he was 86 years old. He'd served the Lord for most of his life, and they arrest him, and they say, just, you know, confess that Caesar is Lord. He wouldn't do it. And so they tied him to a stake, and they built a fire around him, and it says, it says all you got to do is just say Caesar is Lord. Just give in. You don't have to die. He goes, you know what? I've served the Lord all these 86 years, and I'm not ashamed to die for the Lord. And so do whatever you need to do to me. And so they said, the fire is going to be hot. And he tells them, not as hot as the fire you're going to experience. I mean, he wasn't going to go down. He wasn't going to go down, you know, timidly. And so they set the fire, and it says, uh, and those that were witnessing, because there's a big group there, it says the flames leaped up over him like an arch and didn't burn him. And so it was, they were just like, what's going on here? So one of the guards comes and st sticks him in the heart. Blood pours out, and it actually extinguished the fire. But that's how he died. Then they burn him afterwards. And sad situation, but he was not going to bow down because he knew where he's going to spend eternity. Jesus Christ is worth it. He wants to lavish grace and mercy upon each one of us. I mean, think of our brothers and sisters today. We got brothers in, you know, India right now. They're being persecuted. In China, there's heavy persecution against Christians, even though there's approximately 200 million Christians in China. I can guarantee that's probably at least five times as many Christians in China than in the United States. You know, you look at Iran. You, would you like to be a Christian today living in Iran? That'd be brutal, but they are. They're, they're hanging in there with Jesus. I mean, all over the world we find persecution. God wants to lavish His grace, His unconditional favor upon us. He wants, to, wants us to experience His peace that surpasses all understanding, no matter what we go through. You know, in those difficult days of cancer, or you're battling some sickness, or you've had a heart attack or a stroke, or whatever pain you're getting just because you're getting old like me, He wants you to experience His peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, John tells us where this grace and peace comes from. Again, look here in verse 4. Grace and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come. This is a reference to God the Father. This is the true meaning of Yahweh, Jehovah. He, he is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. God is the ever-existing one. He is always the same. He is eternal. A few verses to look at. Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord. The, the word Lord there is Yahweh. I do not change. Therefore, you're not consumed, O sons of Jacob. God is the same. He doesn't change. You can go back as many tomorrow, yesterday as you can. I mean, God is the same. He's, he's not evolving, as some cults say, that He was a man, now He's evolving into a God. No, He's always been God, always will be God. He does not change. This is how God revealed Himself to Moses. Exodus 3, 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am and he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am the self-existing one. He's unchangeable. He's eternal. But guess what? So is Jesus. Jesus is God. He is God the Son. John chapter 8, verse 58, we read, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am taking the eternal name of God. The Jews took stones to stone him, and he said, why do you stone me? For what good work? Not for any good work you do, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. So the Jews knew exactly what he's claiming, to be co-equal with God. Jesus is saying, I am God who has come in human flesh. As far as Jesus being the unchangeable eternal God, a very simple verse, Hebrews 13, verse 8, says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is the one who is and who was and who is to come. And we should all be looking forward to His coming 
because he's coming first for his bride, those that belong to him, and then he's coming back with his bride at his second coming. We'll see that very clearly in chapter 19. In Donald Gray Barnhouse's commentary on Revelation, he says that the Apostle John is giving us a Hebrew description of God's name here. Him who is, Yah, the one who was, Ho, and the one who is to come, Va. You put those three names together and you have Yahovah. This is the only place you find this description in the New Testament. Yahovah. It's revealed here in this verse. Here's one of the wonderful things about God. He is the one who is. <laughs> I'm not this dumb, but he knows who I is. You know what I mean? He knows who I am. He knows all about me presently. He knows everything I think. He knows everything I do. He knows me at this moment. God is the one who was he certainly knows what I was when I was living in sin and rebellion against him, using his name in vain, shaking my fist at him and all the stupid things I did back then. He knew what I was. He knows what you were. Here he is today saying to me, maybe to some of you, Jeff, grace and peace to you. The one who is. I know what you're like. I know you're not perfect. The one who was. I was there. I knew you. I called you from your mother's womb. I knew all the things you were going to do. Yes, this world is falling apart all around you. But I have resources you need to make it through. What is it? You just said, my grace and my peace. That's what we need. He is the one who is to come. He's coming back, but he's also the one that's going to change us and finish what he started in us. Remember Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So he is the one who is to come and he'll fulfill all that he has done for us. And it's all because of his grace and his love for you and me. So God is eternal. He is past, present, and future. So that means we cannot surprise God. We often surprise ourselves. Oh, man, I can't believe I had that thought again. I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I, whatever, you can fill in the blank. I can't believe I said that. I blew it again. God's like, no surprise here. <laughs> you can't surprise God. But His grace and His peace toward us should not come as a surprise to us either. Because as His children, He loves us unconditionally. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And just knowing that should cause us to want to walk closer with Him, to be close to Him, not, you know, turn our back on Him. And then notice this grace and peace comes from the seven spirits who are before God's throne. Who are, what are the seven spirits? Again, what is the number seven? The number of completeness. To me, this is just speaking of the fullness or totality of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that phrase used, and it's spoken of the Holy Spirit around the throne of God. But the seven spirits do not represent angels, because angels do not disperse God's grace and peace, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do. So we're, we're seeing a very unique picture of the Trinity here. Uh, we're going to see this description, again, numerous times in Revelation of the Holy Spirit. But here's a great section. It's in Ze uh, Zechariah 4. Um, we're given a vision that God gave to Zechariah where he sees seven lamps upon a lampstand. Remember the menorah in the Holy of Holies, or the holy place, in the tabernacle and then in the temple. And the menorah represents the Holy Spirit, the light also represents Jesus, the light of the world. But seven lamps upon the lampstand. Then the angel asks Zechariah, you know, do you know what these are? And he goes, no. And then he tells him, Zechariah 4, 6. So he answered and said to him, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So that's what the Lord of hosts, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that seven lamps upon the lampstand. Then Zechariah 4.10, God tells Zechariah, For 
Who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line and the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which, can, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's a person. He's not some kind of a force field like Star Wars, the force be with you. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is God the Spirit. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit is the helper and the comforter. Uh, in, in John 16, around verse 8, it says the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. The only reason I knew I was a sinner back when I was at San Diego State was the Holy Spirit kept convicting me. You're a sinner. You need Jesus. You need help, Jeff. Yeah, and it was the Holy Spirit that finally broke through. So the Holy Spirit convicts. The Father bestows upon us His grace and peace. The Holy Spirit bestows upon us His grace and peace. By the way, I'd encourage all of you to... Seek a, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. You know, they asked D.L. Moody, why do you say you need to be refilled? And he simply said, because I leak. <laughs> yeah, we need to be refilled. Ephesians 4.30 says that uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. First Thessalonians 5 says we can quench the Spirit. When we're grieving and quenching the Spirit because we're walking in the flesh, not in the Spirit... We don't see, we're not experiencing rivers of living water flowing in and out of our lives. We're grieving. We're quenching. And so ask the Lord, cleanse my heart. Renew me, Lord. Draw me. Fill me up again. The Holy Spirit never leaves us. He's always in us. But we want the rivers of living water. And only you know, is this rivers of living water coming out of my life or is it just a little drip? <laughs> drip, drip. Maybe you're a constipated Christian. Ah, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> And I just popped into my head. Sorry, Lord. No, I'm not sorry. Because we do. We, we stop up the flow of the Holy Spirit because we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. So I would encourage you, seek a fresh filling on a regular basis because He is the one who supplies us with all that we need to be victorious in this life. He calls us to be more than conquerors through Him who loves us. Thirdly, we see that grace and peace also comes to us again from Jesus Christ here in verse 5. And here we have one of the great descriptions of Jesus in the Bible. Notice, first of all, he is called the faithful witness. In other words, Jesus is faithful. That means he is genuine. I don't know about you, but whenever I listen to politicians, whenever I listen to the news, and it doesn't matter which station you watch, I go away thinking, is there anyone I can believe and trust? Probably not. A bunch of liars, both sides. They'll tell you what you want to hear, and then they'll do something different. I mean, it's so sad. Here he's called the faithful witness. You know who I can always trust? Jesus. I don't trust the people of this world. Most of them are living for the world, the flesh, and the enemy, but we always keep our eyes on Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, and people have that, and that's how I was before I got saved. I always thought, you know, if there's a God out there, he's probably got a big baseball bat because I was a baseball player, and he's just waiting for me to mess up so he can smack me in the head. That was my picture of God, and I was so wrong because how do we know what God is like? Jesus Christ has revealed to us the heart of God the Father. He's given us the perfect picture of God. He, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says He's the exact representation of God. So this is what we read in John 14, verses 8 to 9. You want to know what God's like? Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Yeah, you think? Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Perfect example of the Father. Perfect representation of the Father. You look at Jesus Christ as He's revealed to us in the Word of God, and that's the best picture you'll ever get of Jesus. Notice it then says here in verse 5 of Jesus, He's the firstborn from the dead. 
What does that mean? Well, look at Colossians 1.15. It says of Jesus, He is the, Im the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then a few verses later, Paul says, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Same thing John says here. What does that mean, firstborn? Because there's some groups out there that say firstborn means he's the first one created. Or he was born first. That's not what firstborn means. The Greek word is prototokos, which means preeminent one. So he's the firstborn over creation because he created all things. So he's preeminent over it. He's the first one from the dead, firstborn of the dead. That means he has preeminence over death because he's the first one to eternally conquer death. So it has nothing to do with birth order. He's not born first or created first, but he has preeminence over all things because he's the creator of all things. Again, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus is the ruler over all the kings of the earth, not Biden or Trump, not Chinese Premier Ying and not Putin. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now notice at the end of verse 5, I'll end with this, to him who loved us, speaking of Jesus, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. By the way, this is very important, the word, the, the word here for loved, who loved us, it's in the present tense. It literally means to him who loves us. He loved you in the past, yeah, but He loves you right now. You might be a big screw-up today, <laughs> but He still loves you, and He's not done with you. The word washed here is in the past tense because Jesus died once and for all for our sins when He hung on the cross. He washed us of all of our sins in His own blood. Amazing. His once and for all death on the cross for our sins is a finished work. We saw this a few weeks ago when we're finishing up Matthew and in John where Jesus says, it is finished, cries out on the cross, to tell us die are paid in full. He washed us in his own blood. Once again, the blood of bulls and goats and the blood of sheep. The old covenant that God established with the Jews, were, all that blood was a temporary covering for sin. That's why they had to keep doing it over and over again. Slaughter the lamb, sprinkle the blood in the mercy seat once a year. You know, kill the lamb, you know, to cover your sins for that year. But not Jesus. He died once and for all for all of our sins. Verse 6, again, it says, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, we'll see more of this in chapters 4 and 5 because we're in heaven with the Lord and he, we sing this new song where we are the kings and priests of the Lord and He's redeemed us with His very own blood. But what an amazing thing to realize. Jesus is going to allow us to rule and reign with Him during the kingdom age. And as kings, we're to lead people as priests, we are to serve people. And for us today, this simply means we need to lead people to Jesus. And then once they come to Christ, we minister to people with God's love and grace and truth and righteousness according to the word of God. And then he says in verse 6, the last word, Amen. That's the intro.